Chapter 12 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape, Chapter 12 Volna the Beautiful. Bram Forrest had been daydreaming. Ilya? Hadn't Ilya been calling his name? But how could that be? Ilya was almost two hundred million miles away. Clearly, as long as they kept the magic disk away from him, he could never see Ilya again. And besides, now that he had been vouchsafed a vision of his dead mother, the former queen of Ofrid, and now that that vision had conjured up the entire tragic past for him, why is it that when he shut his eyes and allowed the bright sun to beat down on the lids through the cell window, he saw an image of the sun-browned maid, Ilya. Could it be, he asked himself, wondering if somehow he were profaning the memory of the mother he had never known, that Ilya stood not for the past, but for the present and the future, and that it was in the present and the unknown future that Bram Forrest must live and do his life's work, and perhaps perish, although he was motivated from the past. A guard brought food on a tray. The cell door clanged open. The tray was delivered. The cell door clanged shut. The guard did not pay a particular attention to Bram Forrest. He had been a docile enough prisoner. Ilya, he thought. He knew he must escape next time the guard brought food. Dr. Slonim held up the bracelet with the metal disc on it and stared curiously at the contraption. He was a psychologist he could hardly consider himself an expert on metallurgy. Still, he had never seen a metal like that from which the disc had been fashioned. It seemed too opaque for steel, too hard for silver. A steel and silver alloy, then? But he had never heard of a steel and silver alloy. He held it up to the light. Like a fly's many-faceted eye, it threw back manifold images of himself. Somehow it made him dizzy to gaze at the images. He drew his eyes away and had an impulse to fling the strange disc away across the room. The sun was going down. He heard a clattering from the prison kitchen as the evening meal was prepared. Tomorrow, he thought, should see the completion of his work here. Another interview with the paranoid giant who had brought the disc, perhaps. The disc fascinated him. He looked at it again. He didn't want to, and recognized the strange compulsion within himself. Then, before he quite realized it, he was staring at his multiple image again. His senses swam. There was a faraway rustling sound, like the words came unbidden to his mind from a poem by Kipling, like the wind that blows between the worlds. He gazed again at the disc. It seemed to draw him as a magnet draws iron filings. Now he wanted to fight it, wanted to fight with every ounce of his strength. A wave of giddiness swept over him, leaving nausea in its wake. He clutched at the prison office desk for support. The rustling grew louder. He saw, or thought he saw, a girl, a lovely sun-bronzed girl. There was a look of fear on her face, she seemed to be crying out for help. An abyss yawned before his feet, before his very soul. He longed, despite himself, to plunge into the abyss, whatever the fearful consequences might be. He lurched back, fighting the longing. Yet he knew he wouldn't win. He took a step forward. Give it to me. The voice, urgent, distant, beckoned him back to reality. It seemed a great distance off, but it was something to which he could hold. Give me that disc. He felt himself dragged roughly back, saw the abyss retreating. The rustling of the wind between the worlds became distant, a sound imagined rather than heard. Give it to me. He blinked. The nausea had washed over him. He felt weak, drained, exhausted but the substantial reality of the prison office surrounded him. The young giant stood before him, strapping the bracelet which held the disc on his powerful arm. 
A look of intense concentration was on his face. His skin was bathed with sweat, although it was cool in the room. "'What did you do to the guard?' Dr. Slonam asked, wondering if the prisoner would slay him. "'He'll be all right. I only hit him. I'm sorry. It was necessary.' The giant spoke in haste. His eyes were clouded, dreamy, as if he had taken an overdose of barbiturates. "'What are you going to do?' "'You saw, in the disc?' "'Yes,' said Dr. Slonam. "'I'm going. It's my way home.' The giant took a step forward, then began to stagger. "'You're home?' Dr. Slonam gasped. "'You're home?' The giant, who had given his name to the prison authorities as Bram Forrest, did not answer. Dr. Slonam reached out as if to grab him. Bram Forrest stood there, a smile and the acceptance of pain fighting for mastery of his face. Dr. Slonam staggered back as if struck his hand had passed through Bram Forrest's body. Staggering, trembling, Dr. Slonam leaned for support on the desk. He could see through Bram Forrest now, see through him entirely. A cold, fierce wind, like no wind ever felt on earth, touched him. He shuddered. When he looked again, Bram Forrest was gone. Retalk the Abarian! the seneschal's voice proclaimed. An uneasy stir passed through the crowd of mourning courtiers in the palace chamber. Retok, ruler of Abaria, did not often visit Nadia. A state of armed tension existed between Abaria and Nadia of the ice fields. Nadia alone of the many disunited nations of Tarth had strength in some ways compared to that of black-forested Abaria. But even then, if a war came between the two nations, the issue would never seriously be in doubt. As a matter of diplomacy, Retok had been invited to the funeral of Prince Jlomek, although neither Bontark, ruler of Nadia, nor his sister, Volna the Beautiful, had ever dreamed he would come. While the crowd milled about in their white mourning garments, Retok told the seneschal, I wish an audience with the Princess Volna. The crowd was suddenly quiet. Volna the Beautiful, haughty, imperious, princess of the royal blood, would certainly refuse to see the Abarian ruler. Nevertheless, the seneschal bowed low, said, Your request will be carried to the staff of the royal household, lord, and disappeared behind a hanging. Some time later, in another part of the palace, Bontark was saying, Volna, Volna, listen to me. You can't see that man now. I'm going to see him, Volna the Beautiful told her brother. So it may not be said that a princess of the royal blood hid in fear behind a wall of tragedy. But sister, with dear Prince Jlomek still not on the burning barge which will carry him down the river of ice on the final journey, from which, please, brother, Volna said a little coldly, I'm going to grant Retok his audience. Don't you understand? He thinks me weakened by Jlomek's death. Oh, I love the prince, yes. He was always so... so quiet and aloof from affairs of state. But I can be strong if strong I have to be. Then you won't change your mind? Bontark asked. He was a fighting man by nature. The devious paths of diplomacy he set foot on only with reluctance. For answer, Volna said, Let me prepare to greet the royal visitor. And she watched Bontark leave her quarters. At once she clapped her hands. Six serving maids skipped through the hangings into her huge bower, and while they clustered, jabbering about her like so many excited birds, she undid the fastening at her left shoulder and allowed her gown of mourning white to fall in a crumpled heap at her feet. She stood naked and perfectly still while the serving-maids administered to her, each girl a master in one of the cosmetic arts. And Volna, she of the haughty face and glorious body, she who already had been beautiful to look upon, 
was soon transformed by the cosmetic arts into the loveliest woman the planet Tarth had seen since the Queen Evala. Her thoughts went to the dead Queen of Ofrid as the maids dressed her again in the mourning garment. Ivala, a woman with beauty to match Volna's, had ruled the most powerful nation Tarth had ever known. Then Volna smiled. Why not another such woman, with hands strong enough and vision clear enough to grasp the chalice of power and drink deeply of its heady brew? Raytok, she was saying a few moments later. She clapped her hands. The maids in waiting withdrew, giggling. Volna, Volna, said the big Abarian ruler. You are glorious. Every jeck of the journey from the plains of Ofrit across the ice fields of Nadia I burned for you. He came very close to her. His face swam before her vision. A hard, strong, handsome face with the cruel eyes of a sadist. Fitting consort for a woman who would rule the world. His lips parted. Volna, smiling, placed her cool hand over his mouth. Then let me put out the fire, she said coolly, for we have much to discuss. But, Princess, I hush. And what exactly were you doing on the plains of Ofrid? Retok's big face flushed red. Then, when he saw Volna was still smiling, he said, When we met last, you mentioned that two men stood between you and the throne of Nadia. Yes, said Volna, mocking him, turning swiftly with the light behind her, sending its bright beams through the white mourning garment and outlining the seductive curves of her body. Jlomek is dead, Retok said simply. Still smiling, Volna slapped the big man's face ringingly. Retok stepped back, startled. Fool, Volna hissed. I can call the guards. I can have you slain. But I, I did not say I was not pleased. But don't lie to me. That isn't why you slew my brother. Well, man, is it? Retok bowed his head. Only in his eyes there was fury. We'll make a strange pair, Volna, you and I, he said passionately. Is it? Retok shook his head slowly. You see, I knew it. I knew it was you when they told us Jlomek had been slain, and yet, because I know you, and know, too, how you are quick to passion, I told myself you had not done it consciously, because I had suggested it to you. Fool! Can I trust such as you? Only Bontark stands between you and Empire, and Bontark is a simple man. As you are a passionate man. Yet you need me, Volna. You need the strength of my arm and my army. What a pair we'll make! Volna stepped into the embrace of his big arms and allowed herself to be kissed. Retok burned for her. He had said so. All men burned for her. She knew that. And before she was finished, every man of Tarth would kneel at her feet and call her queen. Retok drew back, finally, breathing hard. Volna had for him only a cool, mocking smile. At last, he said, There are some who might say Retok of Abaria killed the royal prince. Dolt, were you seen? Retok shrugged, as if it were not important. A band of wayfarers on the Ophridian plain. They were so frightened, they fled at once after I had wounded the white giant. Volna's eyes flashed suddenly. There was someone else? You did not kill him? I tried to. He escaped, Princess. Then you are more a fool than I thought. But I— Be gone. We can't be seen together too much. Take quarters in Nadia City and let me know where you are. You understand? Yes, Princess. She allowed him to kiss her hand, then he withdrew. A few moments later, at her summons, the seneschal appeared. Subtly, her face had changed. No longer was she the desiring and desirous princess. 
Instead, she was a grieving sister, whose brother's body still lay in state in the royal palace. The seneschal, whose name was Procleum, bowed obsequiously. He knew that, by custom, the body of a royal Nadian floated down the river of ice in the company of two living servants, one man and one woman, who would perish with him in the place of the dead. He knew also that he had been Jlomek's favorite, and now lived in constant fear that the Princess Volna would decree that he, Procleum, must accompany his dead master on the journey of no return, to serve him in death as he had served him in life. "'Yes, lady?' the frightened Procleum asked. "'Bontark, our king, grieves mightily for the dead prince,' Volna said. "'All Nadia grieves for Jlomek, lady,' Procleum said, and added hastily, "'Although, I must admit, I do not grieve more than the next man. No, no, it is a mistake to think I was Jlomek's favorite. "'Be that as it may, Bontark grieves, so that for a while, at least, some of the affairs of state will be in my hands. "'I hear and understand, lady.' "'Good.' If anyone comes, anyone at all, whether wayfarers from Ofrid or others, with news of how Jlomek died, they are to be brought at once to me. Is that understood? Yes, my princess, Procleum the Seneschal bowed low once more. Serve me well in this, Procleum, and you will be rewarded in measure. Procleum smiled. I will be the personification of discretion, he said boldly, baring his toothless old gums. Then perhaps I will still the rumors that you were the dead Jlomek's favorite. Procleum dropped at the royal feet and touched his lips to the royal toes. Then he bowed out of the room. Volna stared for many moments at her beautiful face in the mirror. Queen, she thought. She said it aloud, Queen Volna. End of chapter 12